am very optimistic about the future, not for myself, uh, but also for the young investigators who are venturing into this field. And not to be deterred because if the problem is going to be solved, if it is a soluble problem, it will be solved by human effort. It's going to be hard work, it's going to be imagination, and it's going to be application. It's really about what can be done to change the landscape, to actually change the, the, the whole way this disease is seen, looked at, and treated, or prevented. We have a program here now, which is to look at what we call the insulin for ALS. If you can find the insulin for ALS, that missing factor that would revive the neurons or prevent them from degenerating, then we are good. So when we discovered a mutation in a gene that we had localized in ALS type 5, what we found was that there were inclusions in those neurons that had never been seen before in the pathology of ALS. And what we found was that these were granules that are present in all over the body that secrete very important neurotransmitters or growth factors or self-growth factors and so forth. Some we know, but what is there in the motor neuron we fully do not know. We know some, but not all. So if you can find that, then that may be quote-unquote insulin for ALS. We don't know that yet, but that's one of the f aspects that we're doing now and may have results in the f very near future. Then we have targets that are molecular targets that we can now relate to the protein recycling mechanisms in neurons and how we can improve that functioning. That will improve not only the protein recycling, but it will also protein the protein production and its transport and all the activities that one needs for a cell or for a neuron to survive. And so we think that that's a hopeful way forward. The other one that we are looking at is the is what we call the connectome. The connectome is an area that is completely missing on the radar of ALS researchers and clinicians. One reason is it's not accessible. If you look at the human brain, it's all connected. So you can have micro connections that the researchers are working over the world to establish. It's a huge, huge task. We understand the, some of the genes, we understand some of the pathology, we stand the outside picture, the clinical picture of what a person looks like with ALS. But we don't understand the connectome, how all these are connected. It's not like cancer where we know something divides and grows and the treatment ever since x-rays has been to, or before that, has been to cut it out, radiate it, poison it, because you want to get rid of it. Here you have stuff that's disappearing. What are you going to cut out? What are you going to irradiate? What are you going to poison? Things make things worse. So it's the negative of cancer, the other side of cancer. And yet there seems to be some similarities that need to be looked at. And so that's the challenge of the future. How do you make a model for a disease when you only all you have are genetic tools and the environment is, is infinite? So there has to be another way of trying to look at this disease or diseases like this. Help can come from imaging and to look at the live brain. And we have done some of that work with my colleagues here. The problem is that the sensitivity and the ability to look in at the microscopic level does not exist at this time in any regular form to be able to, to do that and to be able to then marry it with genetic information or ex expression of genes or expression of proteins and so forth. So those are the challenges uh, that uh, stare us in the face. But obviously, uh, just using the current methods or the older methods is not going to work. It hasn't worked. And we have to find out why it hasn't worked and really address the question and say, we don't know. There's a knowledge gap. How do we fill the knowledge gap? And question arises, when does pathology become disease? How long do you harbor that pathology and overcome it because it's a redundant system till you get the disease? So those studies are very few and far in between where you have people who have the gene and they develop the disease later on in life and you got them before they got the disease and looked at the pathology. So that's a huge area that is missing in trying to understand in humans when does pathology become disease?
and whether the molecular pathology which exists from day one with genetic disorders, how that, that certainly translate from genetic to protein or other means of the disease. So these are the questions for the near future. We look at silos, we look at this is ALS, but we've now found that genes that cause ALS can cause bone disease, they can cause problems with, with increased pressure in the eye, they can produce muscle disease, and they can produce nerve disease. So certainly if we have been forced out of that silo of saying, this is just motor neuron disease, we find that people get dementia and the, men, the others that I mentioned. So there may be a clue as to how to understand the disease by looking at those organs which are more easily accessible. But we have to let our imagination drift and grow. The world that we look at, the material world we look at, we did not create. We're just trying to discover it, how it works. And each time we have a technological breakthrough, we see more of it. When Hooke discovered the microscope, he certainly found a new world. And I think for people who are starting out now, I just want to tell them that this, this landscape was much bleaker and dismal when I started out. And sometimes one has to just push through. Is there a mechanism by which one can reduce the pain and suffering in the world? And there are many, many ways of doing it. But if you are selected, or if you're elected, or if you elect yourself to do this hard work, which is not going to affect millions of people, but is going to affect the lives of those individual people who suffer, then it's worth having done it. And that's what makes me optimistic. And I think my mission now is to train other people, not only in the technology and to give them my passion, transfer it to be able to achieve results that I have not been able to achieve in my lifetime. How do I transmit that? How do I make them successful? How do I make them proud of the work they do? How do they make them optimistic and insightful and not to be distracted? <laughs>